Amen. You could be seated. I, uh, one day I was at uh, the last church I was pastoring at, and uh, um, this sweet lady who had been in the church forever, um, super kind, very faithful, she came up to me one day and she said, uh, she said, you know, I've never came in the front doors of the church on a Sunday morning. And I said, what? And she said, never came in the front doors of the church on Sunday morning. And I asked why. And she said, well, you have men out at the doors, opening the doors, and I think that's very sweet. And she said, but she had been raped and molested uh, by two men in her life. Uh, and she said when she sees men that she's not related to, she gets very nervous and anxious and said she would go in another route. And, and it was something that like I had never thought of before, never even dawned on me, that that would be something that would weigh on somebody's heart. And then uh, one time I was preaching, it was a Father's Day uh, service, and I, I was preaching a Father's Day message, and this a lady got up, and very hurt and discouraged, walked out. A man had walked out, and uh, later on they came to me and they were talking about uh, hurts that they had had with, with their fathers and things that had happened. One had been molested. Uh, one had been beaten very bad. Uh, a Mother's Day message I was preaching one time, a uh, very similar story of, of some abuse and struggles. And what the Lord was really getting on my heart during that time is to remember um, that my job is to preach the Bible more than it is to preach holidays. I say that to say this. I love you mothers and happy Mother's Day. And you deserve all the happiness and blessings that come your way. But my message today is not geared towards Mother's Day. My message is following the word of God that God has laid on my heart that I'm supposed to preach. And so I, I'm sorry if you came expecting a Mother's Day message. I just want to dig into what God has laid on and what I'm supposed to follow. Are you guys okay with that today? It, it, I don't want to say, if not, the church down the street may, I'm not saying that. But there is later services. You could probably check out somebody. But stay through this one, okay? Guys, open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Before I read the, the passage in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 21, I, I want to read something to you out of Jeremiah 17, 9. And it says this, The heart is more deceitful than anything else, and incurable, who can understand it? I, Yahweh, examine the mind, I test the heart to give to each according to his way, according to what his actions deserve. Do you remember last week, whenever we were going through this in Matthew chapter 5, and we got to this point where Jesus was talking about how he did not come to abandon the law or to, to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And in the passage, he makes a statement. He says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? But you remember this, Jesus knows our hearts and the Lord knows our hearts. And what is it that Jeremiah just said? Our hearts are corruptible. They are terrible. We are wild people sometimes. And, and, and we, it left to our own vices. We can do dangerous things. Whenever I preach a message, I always preach it to myself first. And the message today very much convicts me through and through. And I hope that God speaks to you through it as well. There is a lot of passage. Let me read it, and we'll go back and we'll break it down. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 21. You've heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And whoever one says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says you moron will be subject to hellfire. So if you're offering your gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and first go and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on your way with him or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you'll be thrown or you'll be thrown into prison. I assure you, you'll never get out of there until you've paid the last penny. You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It is also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in the case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again... You've heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. But I tell you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven because it's God's throne or by earth because it's his footstool or by Jerusalem because it's the city of the great king. Neither should you swear by your head because you can't make a single hair white or black, but let your word be yes, be yes, so you know, no, anything more than this is from the evil one. Hey, can I go ahead and say something to you this morning? If you get mad at the message today, remember, I'm just the messenger, okay? I didn't write it. It is the Word of God spoken for us today, okay? I want to look at this because this is what Jesus is saying. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and scribes, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So he continues on with the thought. Jesus did not speak in breaks. He didn't say, now that's the end of that. Let's go to the next verse and we'll talk about it. That's not how he did it. He was continuing on a thought process on the Sermon on the Mount, teaching the people. And he gets to this right after saying, unless you pass this, he says this. You've heard it was said to our ancestors, do not murder. Well, this was an obvious one. You've heard it was said. This was the teachers. This was the law. This is what everybody knew. This is what they followed. Do not commit murder. It's why whenever I was sitting there with the kids and we asked them, just like I asked you a few weeks ago, have you ever told a lie? Yes. Have you ever stolen anything? Yes. Have you ever disobeyed your parents? Yes. Have you ever committed murder? No. Why? Well, because it's obvious how bad that is. We couldn't cross that line at all, right? That was not something that we were supposed to do. Jesus is counting on it. He knows that they have heard this. He knows that they know it. He knows that this is what they have been taught. And then he says, But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And whoever says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, you moron, will be subject to fire. I like how Jesus changes this up. Remember, he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And so here's what he says. You've heard, but I tell you. You've heard the teacher say it. Now listen to the Son of God speaking it, as if establishing his authority. But I tell you. Anyone who has anger in his heart or with his brother is subject to judgment. That's what I was saying in that passage earlier in 1 John 3.15. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life resting in him. Every one of the passages that we preach on today, I battle. Every one of them. You know when I battle this the most? School pick up and drop offs. Oh, man. You know, it says in there, don't say fool or moron. I'm going to be honest with you. That is a common place in my vocabulary a lot of times when I'm at those things. I can get so frustrated and so mad and so aggravated with the way people act. It can just consume me with the way they drive. It's as if they have no clue or concept how to do this. And I will go on a rant all day long about this if you let me. It is craziness. But the truth is, anger is something that is quite a hold on a lot of people. When he says raka or fool, What it means is empty-headed, or it shows contempt for the individual's intelligence. It is challenging them. You are the lowest low. You're so ignorant. You're so dumb. And then when he gets to the next part, moros or moron, it means it, it was talking about how unbelievable, stupid the actions are of the person. I can't believe you would do this. You have low intelligence that you would cross this. But in the midst of all of this, he says, you will be subject to hellfire. Well, that doesn't seem fair. That just because I said something like that, Jesus isn't getting in to sitting there saying, 
that the action of murder and the speaking these things are just bad. What he's saying this is he knows your heart. <laughs> and we're guilty. We're guilty. Remember what he said. Unless your righteousness passes that of the scribes and Pharisees. And now he says, you have heard, do not commit murder. But I tell you, if you have hatred in your heart, you're already guilty of murder with it. I'm taking it that much further. And I know your heart. You're guilty. You're guilty. And we're going to battle this. And this is a challenge that we have to face. It's what our heart is. We are corrupt by our nature. James 1.14 says, Each person is tempted when he's drawn away, enticed by his own evil desires. If that is at the heart of where we are, and we know that wickedness can be there, then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. When I was in third grade, there was a guy that had failed the grade above me. And he came into our grade, and he was the oldest in the grade above him. And I was the youngest in my grade. And so there was essentially almost three years difference between us, and we were in the same grade. When I was a freshman in high school, he was driving, and I didn't get to start driving until my junior year. That's whenever I turned 16. I graduated 17. I, there was a huge age difference between us being in the same grade. And can I tell you something? I hated this guy. And I, I'm, I'm totally 100% trying to be as honest and transparent as I can be. I hated him. We would get in fights all the time, all the time. We would get into it. We got into it in junior high. We got into it in high school. We got into it in elementary. We would get into fights all the time. I could not stand this guy. If there was ever anybody on the face of this earth that I had hatred towards, I had hatred towards him. About, I think it was about 16, 17 years ago, he was out riding uh, one of those uh, UTVs, those razors or ranger things, and he was riding them with his daughter, and he turned the corner real fast, and he flipped out, and the razor crushed his head and killed him in front of his daughter. You know, all I could think of was this. I hated him so much, I never shared the gospel of Jesus with him. Never once. I have no idea if he's in heaven or hell. But I know my heart was so corrupt that I hated him so much and I knew the gospel. But I did not share it and I have no idea where he is now. That hatred can consume you. It can give birth. I did not kill him. I did not do it. But my hatred was so big for him that something even greater than life or death, eternity, I wouldn't share it because of hatred. Now you think in your life, do you have any hatred stored up within you? Is there any of it that was within you, inside of you? There, there are so many people over the elections the last few years that I've watched with, with hatred and vitriol all over the place. And it didn't matter if you were Republican or Democrat. It, it seemed like it consumed so much of America. And it, it was all around us. And it was eating us up all over the place. And it seemed like hatred was just consuming our world. You know what we need? A good old-fashioned revival meeting where people humble themselves and repent. Where they fall on their face and say, Lord, I'm sorry. That's what he gets to right here. Jesus is sitting there saying, he's giving a way to sit there and say, here's how you get your heart right. And he goes like this. He says, so if you're offering a gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother. This isn't something that we have common. It isn't an altar that we come and worship at. But what he is sitting there saying is, get your heart right. Get this solved. Then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on your way with them, or your adversary will hand you over to the judge, the judge to the officer, and you'll be th or you'll be thrown into prison. I assure you, you'll never get out of there until you've paid the last penny. What he's saying is, get your heart absolutely right. Because hatred can consume you and will lead you to this point of death. 
And unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, and if you think you're righteous, realize this, he knows your heart. What about the heart of adultery? Isn't that what he gets to in this next part right here? He says, you've heard it was said, do not commit adultery. They would have all agreed with that. Yes, we know that. That's what we're not supposed to do. Don't cross this line at all. And Jesus knows their very hearts. Unless your heart passes that or your righteousness passes that of the Pharisees and scribes, here's what you need to do. He says, I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Watch any commercial or ad on television. Sex sells. <laughs> I have my retirement through Guidestone Financial Services, and you know what? I'm never going to make that much of a return. You know why? It's a Christian organization. They won't invest in alcohol, they won't invest in tobacco, and they won't invest in pornography. Those are the three fastest growing areas. Won't happen. These things sell. They get a hold of. They target the mind. Let me, let me just go this much further. I will, I will show you how big this is. Did you know 40 million U.S. adults regularly visit Internet pornography websites? How about this? 10% of U.S. adults admit to having an addiction to Internet pornography. 10%. 17% of all women struggle with pornography addiction. 17%. One out of three people that visit porn sites are women. 93% of males say they have viewed pornography before they are 18 years old. It has warped the mind. And I'm guilty too. I have battled these things with lustfulness and struggles that have been there. It was something that was in front of us. It was something that we saw as children. And it warps and it shapes and it changes so much. And it's something that is a constant battle. I have sat with so many men and women that have battled these things. I've struggled. Guys have struggled. Women have struggled. It's something that's in the hearts. And it's something that makes us feel very uncomfortable. We don't like to talk about it. I want you to know something. Jesus knew that too. And so what he was doing was getting to the very heart of those that were out there, those Pharisees and the scribes. Unless your righteousness passes them, I know your hearts and you're guilty. The lust gets a hold. Sex sells. Ads promoted at lustfulness. Constantly bombarding our minds and our attitudes. And we wonder why so many people fall and struggle. Well, it's because we got wicked hearts. And we know we're guilty. And it gets a hold of us and it grabs us so much. He says, this is what it is. If you commit adultery, he goes, if your right eye causes you to sin, he's talking about getting everything right. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. By the way, I love it when people tell me that they're literalists of the Bible. I believe the Bible to be literally true. Really? Have you ever struggled with lust? Yeah, I've struggled with lust. Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Well, I mean, that's not literal. How, how far do you go? Causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Okay, so if we're not going to gouge our eyes out, if we're not going to cut our hands off, how far do we really take this? Can I tell you one of the best things you can do? Shut your TV off. <laughs> how about this? How many of you quit watching the news during this last year because you were so sick and tired of hearing all the fighting wars? You can't find a good news station. Everything is biased or corrupt, and they're all challenging each other. And so you had to shut it off because you didn't want it infiltrating your brain anymore. Did anybody do that? I did it. How about this? What if we did it with the same attitude when it came to sexual nature? What if we did it with the talk that's around us, the jokes that are commonplace? Well, what if we do it with the things that we see constantly around us if we shut it off to end that type of lustfulness in our lives? 
Well, Brother Dallas, you're just being legalistic. We don't need to go that far. Here's the deal. I know how quick it is and tempting to slide. And I'm telling you, do whatever you can to protect your hearts. Because quickly, you can fall. Watch him. Seek him. Get off in his life. I, uh, when I went to Alaska on this mission trip this time, they were telling this story at this orphanage kind of place. It was, it was kids that had just been abandoned. And they were telling us the story, and they said that in villages outside of the mainland, they said it is reported that 91% of all boys will be molested by a family member. 91%. So I end up going the next year. We went back to Alaska, and I was in Fairbanks, and I was visiting with this pastor. And as I was talking with him, I told him that story. I said, can you believe this, how corrupt that is, that 91% of boys will be molested by a family member? And he said this, Dallas, I've never met anybody that has come to my church that has not been molested. Can you believe that? And he said this, if you're going to win their family to the Lord, you need to understand what that daddy did to that boy. You need to understand what that daddy did to that girl, what that uncle did. And if you're going to win them to Jesus, you've just got to get to the point of understanding they need Jesus too. I know this, I, I've never struggled and never will struggle with looking at children in inappropriate ways like that. That's disgusting. Oh, but I am a vile man in my own right. I've struggled with other things and I've struggled with lustfulness. I'm guilty too. And I bet you, if we did what we did with the children earlier, and if I said, raise your hand if you've ever lusted in your heart, and if you were honest, I bet most every hand in this room went up. We're guilty. Do what you can to protect your heart. Jesus says, you want to try to be righteous? You're never going to be good enough. Your heart is wicked. And the heart of divorce gets into this idea of divorce. I was sitting there thinking, Luke and I were talking about this this week. I was like, yeah, this is going to make people mad. Said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice. This is what they knew. This was a challenge. This was what was written on. And men could divorce for almost anything they wanted to. They could go off and divorce if they didn't like their wife, if they wanted somebody else. They could give these divorce. The written notice of divorce was for the woman. It was protection for her. He says, if any one of you give a or want to get a divorce, he must give a written notice divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except for in the case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, here's the challenge. How much of that is literal and how much of it's not? Or is it all? What is the case? What about this? Right now, it is commonplace. We're seeing it in seminaries. We've seen it in churches around that there are people that come into their offices of these pastors, women that have been beaten or women that have been abused or mentally, physically, uh, sexually abused by their spouses. And they come in the office and they confess to the pastor and the struggle with them or to the seminary and they report these things. And here's what's been a common thing is they've used this verse and say, you cannot leave unless it's sexual immorality, and it has created a distrust and a brokenness. Can I go ahead and tell you something? If your husband is beating you, leave. Leave. If there is emotional, physical, absolute abuse, figure it out. Try to figure out a way. And sometimes leaving is to draw them to repentance. They could get to the point of trying to heal themselves. But here's the deal. I will never counsel anybody, anybody, to stay in a relationship where they are getting beat up daily. I won't. I will never lay a hand on my wife. Ever. Never. But I will tell you this. If that day ever came, I would hope that she would be brave enough to try to walk away. Sometimes 
there seems like there's no right answer. But what Jesus is getting at is further than that. He's trying to say this. Men, you could divorce and you could leave your wives for anything. This was in the Old Testament law. They could, they could make choices of whatever they wanted to as long as they gave the written divorce to the woman and they hold on to it. Have you ever looked at it? Have you ever really studied looking at the rules that were there? There are so many different ways that they could walk away as long as they gave the certificate of divorce to their wife so that the wife could be protected and could possibly be reared. Jesus is saying marriage should not be so flippant that you could just walk away. He's going further. And he's saying that it should be deeper than that. One day, I was at a hospital. I was visiting with this. uh, By the way, you guys are super quiet today. Is this too heavy for you? (laughs) I didn't write it. One day, I was at a hospital. And uh, this lady, this senior adult lady, she had gotten cancer. And she was dying. And it would be moments. And uh, I mean moments, days. And we're sitting in the room with her and her husband. They had been married for like 50-something years. And she said, would you pray? And I said, yes. And so we prayed for her and prayed for healing. We prayed that she wouldn't be in any pain. We prayed that if God was going to take her, that he would take her quietly and quickly and easily. And... uh, Anyways, after we got done praying, she said, no, I didn't want you to pray for me. I wanted you to pray for my husband. (laughs) He said they did. She said, no, they didn't. I heard them pray. Here they are. She's on her deathbed and they're arguing, right? (laughs) And she says, no, they didn't. I heard their prayer. They were praying that I would be okay and that I would be healed or that God would call me home. They were not praying for you. I want them to pray for you. And he said, sweetheart, don't you understand? The moment that we said, I do, we became one flesh. And every time they prayed for you, they prayed for me. (laughs) I remember sitting there going like, oh, that's what marriage is. It's not something that you just walk away from. It's not something, it should be something that should be very hard, very difficult, very challenging. Because you're walking away from a part of yourself. And Jesus is saying, I know your heart. I know it. Have men left to their own will walk and they will go to where the grass looks greener. Hey, by the way, can I tell you something? Where the grass is usually greener, that's where the cows poop. (laughs) You could say amen to that too if you want to. He gets in challenging with them. Then he gets into the heart. Again, you've heard that it was said, the rules are, the ancestors, you've heard it said by our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. This would have been commonplace. They knew this, all the covenants that had taken place, all the rules, the ideas of what it took to take an oath, the swearing before court systems, all the things they had to do in place. He knew all of those things. You've heard that it was said. You've studied the law. You know the rules. But here's what I tell you. Don't take an oath at all, either by heaven because it's God's throne or by earth, because it's his footstool. Or by Jerusalem, because it's the holy city of the great king. Neither should you swear by your head, because you can't make a single hair white or black. But let your word, yes, be yes, and your no be no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. Whoa. He's saying, I know it. This is the oath. And it wasn't the oaths are wrong in general. It's not something they had to do. Hebrews 6, 13 says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself. I will indeed bless you, and I will greatly multiply you. And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham attained a promise. For men swear by something greater than themselves, and for them a confirming oath ends every dispute. But God wanted to show his unchangeable purpose even more clearly to the heirs of the promise. He guaranteed it with an oath so that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have fled for refuge, might have strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. 
Even Jesus himself spoke of an oath. In Matthew 26, 30, or 63, it says, But Jesus kept silent. Then the high priest said to him, By the living God, I place you under an oath. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said it, Jesus told them, but I tell you. In the future, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power of God, coming in the clouds of heaven. But Jesus knows our hearts. <laughs> and you could go around kids right now, and you could ask them a question. Who did this? And they will say, not me, I swear. Right? There's many people that have even stood up whenever you do marriages, and you make these oaths, these vows. And they come up and they throw them out the window and they break them. He knows our hearts. He knows who we are. He's sitting there saying, do not make these because you can't keep them. This isn't who you are. It's like Joshua. Do you remember the story where Joshua, whenever he's settled into the land and he looks at the people and he's challenged them, he says, you decide who you're going to worship. If you're going to worship the gods of your ancestors, or you're going to worship the foreign gods, the ones of the land. As for me and my household, we choose to serve the Lord. And do you remember what the people said? We will serve the Lord too. And do you remember Joshua's response? No, you won't. <laughs> I know you. You're not going to do it. That's not how you are. I know you're a fickle people and you're going to turn back. No, 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 no. We'll do it. We're going to worship the Lord. And he said, then make a covenant to this day. And you decide who you're going to worship, but you make the covenant and you follow it. So they did. They made the covenant. They drew the line in the sand. They decided if they were going to follow or not follow. And do you know what happened? Sooner or later, they rebelled and they turned and they started worshiping other gods again and they got in trouble. You know why? Because we're sinful people. Never to be good enough. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. You've heard the rules of what you're supposed to do. Do not commit murder. You think that's enough. Do not commit adultery. You think that's enough. Do not divorce. You think it's enough. Keep your oaths. You think it's enough. But here's the truth. Your heart is wicked, and so I'll take it further. You have hatred in your heart. You're guilty of murder. Lust in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. Divorce, I'm telling you, if you do this, you're causing sinful nature just walking away. I'm going to go that much further. Your oaths, you have no power to swear by. You're not going to keep it. Because I know you. The law, we said it last week, was the schoolmaster that brought us to Christ. It was us understanding we were never going to attain it enough. How righteous do you have to be? How many times do you have to sit in church on a Sunday morning before you're considered righteous? How many times do you have to read the Bible through before you're considered righteous? How many good acts or deeds do you have to do before you're considered righteous? How many times do you have to take the pastor out for lunch before you're considered righteous? Which, by the way, you guys are failing at. Never. <laughs> You're never going to be righteous enough. But God knew while you were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for you. He knew it, and he loved you anyways. And here's a vow, if you want to take one. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, do you know what that means? If you sit there and say, okay, you're in control. You're in control. And I'm not good enough on my own. I surrender to you. And if you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. So you confess it and you believe it. Then you will be saved. Not if you attend enough Bible studies, not if you do enough good works, not if you give enough money. If you confess, I'm not good enough. And you're in control. And if you believe God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you know what saved means? It doesn't just mean that you're slightly rescued or you're okay. It's like this. As if hell opened up below you and Jesus reached down and grabbed you while the flames were licking your ankles. 
save and rescue from the death that we so desperately deserve. But he loved you so much, he would take it from you. Now I can stand up here and I can say, I'm guilty. But I'm forgiven. Because my Jesus loves me. My Jesus loves you. Have you confessed him as Lord? Have you believed in your heart? Have you realized your heart is wicked? And you just need Jesus. When you hear a sermon like this, it's heavy. It's hard. It's tough. So many interpretive challenges and, and so much that you weigh with it. I don't enjoy it. You probably don't enjoy it. But it should bring you to the point of realizing this. How great is our God. How great is he? That he loved us anyways in spite of our wicked hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, for three weeks we've gotten to see seven baptisms. Oh, and we rejoice and we love it and we're excited about it. And God, we should be. We should be rejoicing for those that make commitments to you and how amazing it is. But God, maybe we should also get to the point of thinking this, that we should thank those that fall on their face and we should praise your holy name for those that repent and sit there and say, I know I am wicked in my heart and I need forgiveness, Lord. I need grace and I need mercy and I need your justice, Lord. I need you to remind me that I'm not good enough to do this on my own. God, so here's what I pray. I call on people to repent and I ask you, Lord, convict the hearts. Am I the only one in a room that is guilty of these struggles, Lord? Am I the only one that is guilty with hatred or guilty with lust? Am I the only one that have thought about when times are hard how easy it would be to walk away and divorce? Am I the only one that's fallen in my oaths? Or are there others? And is repentance something that you call us to, to sit there and realize in our heart how grateful we should be to you? how thankful we are for what you've done. So God, if I'm the only one, if the message was for me today, then I praise your name for speaking to me. And I thank you, God, for convicting my heart, drawing me to repentance, and reminding me of grace that you have for me. But I bet I'm not. If others are truthful in their heart, I bet they would admit they're guilty too. God, we want revival, and we pray for a revival of America, but it's like we wait for it to happen at the church down the street. Why not here? Why not now? It takes repentant hearts falling on their face, renewing their faith in you. So God, send revival. Convict your people. Lord, it's in your name we pray.